The lone courier gallops across a countryside divided by conflict. With the utmost urgency, he sets off for the frontier, carrying vital packages a longtime client desperately needs. When he arrives at the mighty Hudson River, the boundary between British and rebel-held territory, the British sentries relax, recognizing him. After a brief, half-hearted inspection, they allow him to cross the Hudson into rebel territory so he can deliver this precious cargo. This seemingly harmless man, whom the British overlooked, was a vital asset to the Continental Army, often delivering his information straight to Alexander Hamilton or George Washington. Little did the sentries know, this man's intelligence would save Washington's life on two separate occasions. He was an enslaved African American who, after receiving his freedom in 1778, worked alongside his former master, the tailor Hercules Mulligan, to support the Revolutionary War effort. His name was Cato Howe, and his story is what we will be looking at today. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Today's video will be a bit shorter than usual, but the story of Cato bears repeating. As we lack concrete details on Cato's life before or after the American Revolution, at the end of this video, we're going to take a step back and reflect on the historical memory of African Americans in the fight for independence. We also need to keep in mind that being a good spy means leaving behind little evidence. While this lack of records certainly hampers our ability to tell their story, we can still strive to create a comprehensive portrait of Cato and Mulligan's activities by piecing together the information we do have. Just keep in mind that the story we are telling here will contain some speculation. Mulligan and Cato's impact on specific events is still a matter of debate among historians. We also need to recognize something, too. Precisely what the relationship dynamic between Cato and Mulligan was still isn't clear. Though Cato was freed in 1778, he remained working for Mr. Mulligan. Was Cato a faithful accomplice who volunteered to risk his life for the Patriot cause, as one historian put it, or was he co-opted into this struggle by his former master in a type of indentured servitude? We will never know for sure. All we know about Cato's early life is that he was inherited by a tailor in New York City named Hercules Mulligan when his father, Hugh, passed away. To tell Cato's story, we also need to tell Mulligan's. But before diving right in and talking about their heroic exploits, let's try to understand how they became some of the revolution's most successful spies. Any successful spy needs three things to stay alive. To blend in, to make connections, and the last one is a two-for-one, to get lucky and create their own luck. Cato and Mulligan had all three in spades. The more famous Nathan Hale did not. Mulligan's wife, Elizabeth Sanders, was the niece of a British admiral, Charles Sanders. His connection to the upper echelons of British society would help protect him when he and Cato came under suspicion. It also made it easier for the British to overlook his less-than-loyalist past. Mulligan had served as a member of the New York Committee of Correspondence and in the 2nd Massachusetts Regiment. You'll remember from our Robert Morris video that committees of safety or committees of correspondence, were shadow governments that sprang up in the colonies to replace royal officials. These committees issued laws, enacted policies, and issued regulations, serving as a de facto governing body even before the American Revolution. But his loyalty was presupposed because he had remained in New York after the British occupation. He was married to an admiral's niece, and he was willing to serve British officers and troops at his tailor shop. A tailor shop is also the perfect place to gather information. Enlisted men and officers alike need their jackets repaired or their pants hemmed. 
By socializing with these men during their visits, Mulligan and Cato could build rapport with their unwitting victims, making it easy for them to ask seemingly innocent questions when the soldiers let their guard down. And Cato was the perfect courier. Everyone knew his master was a tailor. It made logical sense that they'd need to make deliveries to the homes of wealthier clients, and Cato would be the one making these deliveries instead of Hercules. His ability to move around freely and without suspicion was an invaluable asset to their espionage work. A spy's information is useless if they can't relay it. Also, Cato was black. Many British soldiers shared the same racist views as their American adversaries. These biases and preconceptions of racial superiority meant they ignored Cato altogether, assuming he was too stupid to be involved in something as subtle or ingenious as espionage. This observation should not discredit Cato's service or lessen the legendary nature of his exploits, but it does help explain part of what made him so successful. As Sun Tzu wrote in The Art of War, there is no greater danger than underestimating your opponent. For a spy, however, there is no greater advantage. As we shall see, this duo also got lucky in obtaining some of their key information. With all that out of the way, let's dive into Cato's services during the war. As we mentioned earlier, when the conflict began, Cato and his owner enlisted in the 2nd Massachusetts Regiment in 1775. It was common for owners to enlist their slaves in their stead. Still, it was out of the ordinary that Hercules served alongside Cato. One source, the book In Small Things Forgotten by James F. Dietz, claims that Cato fought in the Battle of Bunker Hill. However, I could not find any other sources to corroborate that claim, so take that for what you will. After the fall of New York City in late 1776, Mulligan and Cato began espionage operations at the behest of Mulligan's old friend Alexander Hamilton. One of their first plots involved cooperating with Chaim Solomon, a Polish-Jewish financer the British convicted of espionage. Solomon, who is definitely someone we will be covering later in this series, received a pardon for his crimes on the condition that he would serve as an interpreter for the Hessian troops that were stationed in New York City. Solomon often visited Mulligan's tailor shop to translate advertisements for the Hessian officers and, in the process, would pass along valuable intelligence. Cato then smuggled these messages to Hamilton or Washington. In April 1777, Cato made the arduous journey that we shared at the very beginning of this episode. After being ferried across the Hudson, he relayed intelligence about General William Howe's impending plan to seize Philadelphia by forcing the Continental Army to make battle. While Washington would end up losing the Battle of Brandywine and the British would take Philadelphia, this information still proved vital, allowing Washington to avoid Howe's entrapments. At this point, the British knew they had a leak. The Provost Marshal of New York City, William Cunningham, suspected Mulligan was behind the leaks. He eventually arrested Cato, questioning him about his deliveries out of town. While we aren't sure, Cato was likely tortured during these interrogations. Cato remained quiet, however, and was eventually released by Cunningham, who thought that he knew nothing, and for the time being, stopped suspecting Mulligan too. It's widely believed that the duo thwarted two attempted assassinations of George Washington. In the winter of 1779, a British officer needed a new coat. I'll let John C. Hamilton, the son of Alexander Hamilton, recount the event. A partisan officer, a native of New York, called at the shop of Mulligan late in the evening to obtain a watch coat. The late hour awakened curiosity. After some inquiries, the officer vauntingly boasted that before another day, they would have his rebel general in their hands. This staunch patriot, as soon as the officer left him, hastened unobserved to the wharf and dispatched a billet by a negro, giving information of the design. 
While Hamilton, unsurprisingly, glorifies Mulligan's role in the affair and demotes Cato merely as a Negro, this shouldn't be surprising. Remember how we talked in episode zero about how and why history was written. It was much easier to glorify Mulligan than Cato. The second plot was uncovered in early 1781, not by the big mouth of a loyalist officer, but by chance. In March, General Washington was planning to meet General Rochambeau, the commander of the French forces in North America in Newport, Rhode Island. Learning this, the British prepared a cavalry force to seize Washington as he traveled through Connecticut. Mulligan's brother, Hugh, a dockhand, helped load the British ships carrying the soldiers that were ordered to intercept Washington on his route. Hugh relayed the message to Hercules, and Cato then smuggled this information out of the city straight to Washington. This was when things got too hot for them. Once again, falling under suspicion, the two were forced to end their espionage work abruptly. Cato and Mulligan would live to see New York City liberated, though, in November 1783. After the war, now a free man, Cato and his wife, Althea, moved to Plymouth, Massachusetts. He and three other former slaves that had served in the Continental Army, Prince Goodwin, Plato Turner, and Quomoni Quash, founded an all-black community along with their families. At this time, this unique settlement was called New Guinea. Today, it's known as Parting Ways. Life at the settlement was hard. The soil was gravelly and poor. Cato, who had tried farming on the land, applied for and received a pension in 1818 based on reduced circumstances. His wife, Althea, died in 1821, and he married Lucy Predizen the same year. The two remained married until Cato's death in 1824. Cato Howe's legacy is rather straightforward. He was a patriot who risked his life for American independence. Had he or Hercules been caught, they both would have been hung. But we can't avoid wondering if Cato fought willingly or if he was an unwilling participant that Mulligan coerced. While the latter is certainly possible, I'm inclined to think he served willingly. Why would he endure the abuse of the Provost Marshal Cunningham to protect Mulligan if he was being coerced? Why would Mulligan trust him to the degree that he did? And since Cato was smart enough to successfully cross the Hudson and deliver information and return without raising suspicion at all, he could have turned his former master in to any British soldier he encountered. As for Cato's place in the historical memory, well... We talked about how and why African Americans were largely omitted from the historical record in episode zero, so I won't touch on that again here. But I will, however, talk about the legacy of Parting Ways. The Parting Ways community offers an incredible insight into the lives and stories of four African American men and their families. Here, the sacrifices of these men can finally be honored. However, we must also recognize that the place is also a microcosm of perpetuating inequality. In 2016, one of the longtime members of the Parting Ways nonprofit organization, Wayne Barboza, lamented that the city of Plymouth doesn't clean or maintain the men's graves. This is a veterans cemetery, he said, and it doesn't even get clean. What do you think the uproar would be if a local or state government didn't maintain a veterans cemetery for the dead? Plans to build a museum on the site have been in the works for four decades. But public support in the city that claims to be the true birthplace of America has never been forthcoming. We need to ask ourselves then, why hasn't it? In the end, I think Cato's story makes it clear how far our country has come and how far we still have to go to honor the sacrifices of Cato and the thousands of other African Americans who served their country during the Revolutionary War. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the first U.S. diplomat, Silas Dean.